Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Packer. I'm a research associate at Washington State University within the Sustainable Seed Systems Laboratory. And today it is my pleasure to introduce Clara Stancheski. Clara Stancheski is a PhD student in the lab of Professor Mark Tester at the Center of Desert Agriculture of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. During her PhD studies, she is investigating the genetic architecture of agronomically important traits in Kinopodium quinoa using comprehensive phenotyping and genome-wide association studies. Her interest in plants and climate change impacts were sparked during her BS in marine science obtained from NUIG Ireland in 2016 with a thesis titled Characterization of Zostera Marina Meadows on the Irish West Coast and Responses to Experimental Global Warming Scenarios. She followed her interest in climate change further through her MS in climate change science and impacts which she obtained in 2017 from UCD Ireland. With her current work, she is hoping to contribute to the efforts toward food security, which is one of the many challenges intensified by climate change. With that introduction, Clara, the time is now yours. Thank you for the introduction, Daniel. Um, one of the reasons why we are very interested in quinoa is the ability to maintain yield under harsh conditions, such as drought, salinity, low temperature and frost, high altitudes, marginal soils. And uh, here you can see uh, one picture that Mark took in Bolivia, uh, where you, quinoa is clearly growing um, there on the side of the road um, on, under challenging conditions. Um, quinoa is also very heterogeneous and has not been um, domesticated to the level of other cereal crops, which is um, leading to a great potential for future breeding. Um, and the, uh, the um, genetic variability is actually can actually be of beneficial um, benefit for farmers uh, that are growing quinoa under challenging conditions, um, because that way um, they're guaranteed to at least have some uh, of the yield that they were expecting and they're not losing all of it. Um, but uh, quinoa is also um, uh, widely still hand harvested, which is a problem for um, upscaling productivity. Um, so to increase yield and productivity, we ideally want to be able to identify idiotypes uh, for different environments. Mm -hmm. And for this, we need information on how varieties perform in the different envir environments. And that information is also um, feeding genetic studies and breeding efforts. And um, uh, for that, to be able to speed up the whole process, it is very important that we have an international, international consensus on phenotyping and how we collect the information um, uh, because that uh, will uh, yeah, help us to work together on improving phenotyping uh, quinoa further. Um, the, uh, just to tell you that um, all the um, techniques that we have, um, are, I'm presenting now in this um, uh, talk um, are, are also uh, leading into a um, phenotyping paper that we are working on at the moment. Um, but it's all a work in progress, so any inputs will be greatly appreciated. Um, so just to give you an introduction um, to where we are getting the um, information, uh, the, where we gained our experience um, with quinoa in the field, the majority of the experience. Um, firstly, we're based in um, Saudi Arabia at um, KAUST, um, in the, uh, as mentioned already in Professor Mark Tess's lab. I want to highlight especially also Dr. Gordon Wellman and Gabriele Fina, who have been um, kind of um, starting a lot of these protocols. And uh, I'm now um, uh, improving them and uh, we're in getting it all together. Um, and then we also have field trials in uh, China. We have two field trials in China at two different locations. Uh, two different um, altitudes and uh, one field trial in Konanara in Australia where we actually have already three field trials. Here is uh, just a picture of our collaborators uh, in Australia and uh, Mark Warmington is also um, presenting at this conference uh, and as is uh, David Wu. Um, so here you, I'm just showing, I just want to show you 
how phenotypically plastic the quinoa can be. Uh, so this is one accession um, and you can see the photographs from the diff four different environments, Saudi Arabia, Australia, um, Shaanxi in China and Qinghai in China. These are all, uh, they, are, they, are, they have a, a wide range of elevations going from uh, 40 meters to th up to 3000 meters above sea level. Um, different temperatures and also day length is varying. And one of the um, high, uh, first uh, uh, differences that you can observe is the average plant height, which, is, which has huge differences. So there's a multitude of factors that are varying um, in all of these um, environments. So, so to be able to um, associate the phenotype, phenotypic information that uh, we find, it's very important to also always um, record the environmental information as much as possible. So there's a few, um, uh, a few uh, minimum uh, data that we, we, are, we should try to um, collect for each of our experiments. Um, that would be including soil data, the general information like latitude, longitude and elevation, but also in, um, information about um, uh, soil density. If you're having electric, um, a salinity trials, electrical conductivity is also important, the pH of the soil and um, uh, nutrients in the soil as well. And then other um, weather data as well, it would be great if there could be an automated weather station in the field, but if not, um, just to yeah, try uh, and get as much uh, information as possible, like precipitation and temperature is very important, um, solar radiation, uh, relative humidity, or um, wind speed as well. Um, and all of this is important to um, kind of keep in mind. There, there's also a list, uh, for, for example, for the um, minimum information about plant phenotyping experiments, Mariapi, that's an open community driven um, project to harmonize data from plant phenotyping experiments. Um, and um, also to keep in mind is the um, decision support system for agrotechnology transfer, um, which um, is a software application program that uh, compromises uh, crop simulation models for over 42 different crops. And recently also uh, quinoa has been um, uh, taken up into this uh, simulation um, model. Um, so there's also a few minimum uh, measure information that you have to collect to be able to use this, this model. Um, so then when, uh, when it, what is also important to consider is uh, the um, experimental design because not only between continents are there lots of variables but also within one field trial. Um, it depends obviously on the size of the trial but um, uh, the fields are never equal so you will have to take um, try and be able uh, to be able to uh, spatially correct for um, any variabilities across the field um, and for that it's important to have replication. It's recommended to have at least 25% replication, but obviously the more replication, um, the better. Uh, if uh, it's not possible to have a uh, full, fully replicated field, um, you can also have check lines, which is the different colored um, plots here in this uh, example uh, field map. Um, uh, plot, regarding plot size, it, it's better to have um, bigger plots, um, maybe a five by three meter or two by two meter is also okay work, which is what we have in a lot in a lot of our trials. Um, and planting density, uh, we we plant we try to plant um, ten centimeters between plants and twenty five centimeters between rows. Um, and because of these. Uh, um, environmental uh, factors. Um, it's also important to have uh, an edge plots all around the field um, to remove some of the um, variation that uh, is, is uh, showing. Um, because you also find an edge effect um, at a plot level. Um, this graphic uh, 
that I drew um, is trying to visualize that, that um, the fact that, that because uh, of differences in irradiation or uh, nutrients or just simply space, um, the plants on the edges of the plot can be um, taller or shorter and often much branchier than the ones in the middle. So that is very important to keep in mind throughout the phenotyping process is to focus, focus on uh, the plants on the inside of the plot because that is what is relevant then when you have um, uh, when you're looking at uh, a, a big field. Um, so my, my, my talk is uh, uh, focusing on the mature plant phenotyping event, which is usually just before harvest. Um, uh, but first I can, uh, I will just uh, tell you about a couple of traits to try and um, also monitor throughout the growing um, period, which is uh, firstly the BBCH scale. Um, that is uh, um, a very important, uh, so Sosa uh, Zuninga et al. Uh, in 2017 have published um, uh, the a description of the phenological growth stages for quinoa and that has, very, has been very valuable to include in the phenotyping. Um, so there are each of the growth stages are described very well with a number descriptor. Um, and it's going from uh, germination to up to senescence. Um, and often, uh, usually in the uh, mature plant phenotyping event at the end, just before harvesting, we have a range of uh, uh, our plants are usually between in, in these two stages. Um, and then here you can show that uh, you can see that each growth stage is also broken down into a more deta detailed um, uh, stages with a descriptor code, um, which is uh, how we record the BBCH. Um, so if, if it's possible, um, it would be uh, good to try um, and be able to record at least these uh, these few that um, uh, these few factors that I have listed here. Um, one sowing sowing data obviously being very important, and also the onset of flowering that we have defined. Uh, we're defining as when you have two flowers on a panicle of one plant, that would be the onset of flowering of that plant. Um, and when 50% of the plants in a plot are flowering, that is then the flowering time for the plot. Um, and this is here a picture where you can see the two flowers on one panicle. Um, that picture was taken by Dylan Sarange um, from the University of Kiel. He's uh, working on flowering time in quinoa. Um, and then because it is uh, quite difficult to uh, and labor intensive and time intensive to be monitoring um, plants throughout the entire growing season because uh, yeah, it takes a long time. Um, it, one of the promising factors to take into account uh, would be um, the data you can collect uh, with uh, drones, um, which is uh, uh, yeah, on manned vehicles where, where you can have fly different cameras over the field. And there's a, a lot of phenotype, uh, phenotypes you can extract from, from these. Um, so now I will move on to the mature plant phenotyping event that usually takes around two weeks, depending on the number of um, pl plots you have and the size of, size of the field. Um, one of the things that are really, really important to consider is the fact that uh, because of the size of the field, of, of, often you would have multiple people phenotyping, so you can split up the work. Um, but it's very important that you um, find a consensus for, for scoring. So at the beginning, we, we usually 
score a number of plots together until we actually agree on all of the um, scorings. And then also throughout the day, we would keep coming back to um, score some plots at the same time and then compare and make sure that we are still um, in the same kind of mindset. And we, so we try to cal kind of calibrate ourselves. And uh, what it has been very handy, if it's possible, and we, if you have the um, uh, source uh, available, uh, availability to use an iPad or something like it, that has been very helpful because it reduces the amount of errors that are then introduced when you are um, writing, copying all the um, everything into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but because even when when you are able to use an iPad, there are lots of errors that can um, just happen. <laughs> um, that is why taking photos uh, has also proven very um, valuable when you're then analyzing the data and you find strange outliers you can go back to the images and check to see uh, what happened there sometimes you're able to um, recover that information um, so what we do is we try to take one picture of the whole plot uh, one of the entire plant where we use a pole for um, for a height reference and we use a black background which is very important because as you can see in the whole plot picture it's very difficult to really see the details of the plant with uh, the messy background um, and we also take a close-up closer up picture of the panicle and a picture of uh, a few of the seeds on a square bl um, blue card background which is important um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that um, at the end of my talk again. Um, so one of the first phenotypes we kind of assess, we, we, we do start with the whole plot phenotypes. Um, so with these, we are um, uh, looking at, uh, first of all, the heterogeneity. Um, so you look at um, uh, how, um, outcrossed uh, or the, the ten, you get an indication of the tendency for outcrossing which is important um, and also you are getting an indication of whether um, you might need to remove these accessions from your um, analysis later on because when an accession is completely mixed which is what we call seven uh, score seven then uh, the main accession is not even identifiable and uh, you can't really um, use that data then. Um, so we give it a, a score from one to seven with one um, where plants are the, the, um, all the same. And one and th scores one and three should be uh, mostly considered for, for um, any analysis with this data. Um, when we are taking um, uh, measuring uh, assessing heterogeneity it, there's a few factors that we kind of mostly take into account of plant height um, panicle color stem color and panicle shape because it's uh, very easy um, to um, identify and um, is uh, uh, tends to be heritable um, another, the next uh, phenotype would be we look at plant erectness. Um, so here we have, uh, we, we look at, uh, uh, on the, in this picture you have the idiotype which would be a straight plant and um, on the side here it's very lodged uh, or like it, it has a lean to it. So the way we, um, we categorize the plant it would be um, depending on the angle of the lean of the plants. Uh, here you see a, a one would be pretty much straight, whereas a seven, that would be the plants in the picture as well, uh, where, they're ha where they have a significant lean to them and they're nearly on the floor. This is important because of machine harvesting. And the next uh, phenotype would be panicle droopiness. Um, 
there, it, it, often they can call it, you're just looking at the panic leaf, the droopiness of the panicle itself. Um, again, with kind of a, um, a, a, an angle reference where seven would be uh, where panicles are pointing towards the ground. And you, again, you note the average of the plot. Um, then we have a number of phenotypes where we are assessing kind of the percentage of the plot that is affected with uh, one up to 10% and seven, seven, uh, seven over 70%. Um, these phenotypes would be, um, for example, snapping. Uh, snapping is where the stem is actually broken um, and the panicles would actually have to be harvested now. Uh, whereas in uh, the next phenotype, lodging, um, there the stem is intact, but the plant is lying um, on the floor. Often you, um, with severely lodged plants, you can see that the panicle is actually uh, kind of growing upwards. And so it has been growing like this for, for the entire time. Uh, stem lying is a, another phenotype that we observe sometimes, um, and it's when the stem is not um, coming from the ground um, straight up, but it has a kink to it and it grows along the ground before rising up. Um, the next uh, phenotype to consider is branchiness. So we have a score from one through seven again, um, where, where we are um, assessing how branched the majority of the plants are. Um, one be, be having no branches and seven is being severely branched. And we, we assess the inside and the outside of the plant, uh, the plot separately, um, considering the uh, edge effect again. Um, here you can see an example for what uh, plants that would be uh, that, that with a score one uh, through seven would look like. But it's also, the, these are also examples for the next phenotype, which is growth habit. And the difference for growth habit is that you are looking at the branches that are coming from the top of the plant. Um, so you're not assessing the branchiness uh, of the entire plant. Uh, this picture was taken uh, from the um, state of the art report of quinoa in the, um, and we found that it, these pictures were actually not take it, uh, not representing all of the um, forms that we see in the field. Um, so we have built on this and um, have included a few others to um, kind of uh, make, make it more understandable. Um, so here, for example, um, we don't have any branches from the base. So even though there's branching uh, from, the, from the top, um, it's categorized in the same. This is because uh, it's important for harvesting, uh, of the machine harvesting to have um, no branches from the base, or at least you wouldn't lose them. And uh, a seven would be where even a, a main panicle cannot be identified. Um, so now I'm moving on to the plant level phenotypes. Um, for this, we then select one representative plant from the from the plot, usually from the middle of the plot. Um, we don't we ignore outliers or any odd plants. We want one representative one. And then for hetero, heterogeneous plots, you can if they have like a score five and you have more than one distinct uh, phenotype, you would you can maybe record two separate ones. But as I mentioned. Uh, a score of seven would be completely excluded from the analysis. Um, so we have a number of quantitative traits, um, like for example, we measure plant height, as I mentioned with the pole. Um, plants uh, that are not fully erect are lifted up. Um, and then we also lift the pole to measure um, panicle height. Um, and, and stem thickness. Then we also look at the um, number of significant panicles. Um, there we count only the panicles that are, um, that uh, we count only the panicles that are actually contributing to the yield. 
and um, we ignore little side branches at the base. Um, so then we also have a number of categorical phenotypes, um, for example, panicle shape, panicle density, panicle leafiness, panicle color, and stem color. Now I will just um, uh, briefly show you some uh, examples by the different um, categories. So um, for panicle shape, we have uh, a score one, which would be a glomerulus, um, uh, uh, which is what we call glomerulus. Um, so you kind of have bulbous clusters. Um, and um, on the other side of it, you have a score five um, called a Maranti form, um, which we also kind of refer to as fingers. Um, and then you have an, a score for intermediate ones where, you, where the panicles express kind of a mixture of both. Um, for panicle density, you go from the loose panicles uh, of a one through to a very densely compact seven panicle. Um, the, difference here is uh, for a, a, a score of a three, you can still see some panicle axes, um, uh, whereas, uh, yeah, for five, it's, uh, it's, very, it's already quite dense, and a seven is very rare to find. Um, panicle leafiness, again, we score from one through seven, uh, with no leaves, up to very leafy uh, panicles. Um, and then we also give it a, 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 a reference for color, for panicle color and stem color. Um, and as I mentioned, because of the large variability in the field here, you can see um, that um, during this one big plant mature phenotyping event at the end, uh, we are uh, observing large natural variation in the speed at which um, the plants are reaching this uh, stage. And um, uh, that's why it's very important to record the BBCH uh, score as again as well, because um, that also gives you an indication of maybe you cannot really include um, an accession in your analysis later on because it's not very comparable if it, the plant is much, much younger than the others. Um, Another, um, uh, uh, now I'll just mention quickly the harvest and post-harvest um, phenotyping uh, procedure that we have in the field. So we take, um, it's very important to count how many plant, plants per plot you are harvesting. Um, we take uh, four plants. Uh, we usually try to take four plants, but it depends on the plot size. Um, and then uh, we try, if we want to um, collect also total dry plant biomass, we cut the four plants at the base, we weigh the entire plant, may record dry weight, um, then we um, weigh and thresh them, and we weigh the seed at the, um, at the end. And then you can collect, um, calculate a yield per plant, and uh, not only for comparing um, between trial, accessions between trials, but also uh, to have uh, it, it meaning something, it's important to count how many plants you harvested. Um, and now I want to go back to the, the um, picture of the card with the seeds that uh, I mentioned. Um, uh, the, we, together with um, Nathan Miller from University of Wisconsin-Madison, he has developed an algorithm for um, analyzing these images. So you can um, get information on seed dimension and seed color. Uh, don't get misled. Now, this is um, the algorithm, um, uh, the false color images. It's not the color of the seed, but um, the algorithm can also extract the seed color. Um, and that's a, an easy and cheap way for people that don't have um, the resources available to do these um, uh, extensive e image uh, seed analysis that Evan uh, would be talking about, but it might be an easy way to um, just quickly get um, these extra data sets as well. Um, and this, these pictures can even be taken with a phone camera and it's, uh, um, uh, it, 
works, the algorithm works, works with that. So with that, I, I'm finishing up. Um, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, the collaboration is the best way forward. As I mentioned, we are working on a publication to um, kind of, uh, yeah, to publish this, uh, uh, these ideas and to get, um, uh, it would be great to get feedback and anyone um, who would like to collaborate and uh, give us some input, that would be great. So uh, uh, please contact me for that. Um, already I have um, a number of, there's a number of people to thank for this. It, this has been already a very great collaborative effort. Um, so I want to highlight especially um, Mark Tester and uh, uh, everyone from my lab who have started and developed this these, uh, this project that I'm so lucky to work on. Um, then I also want to thank from KAUS, um, the Hydrology and Land Observation Group. Um, they're the, the um, drones people, how we call them, and um, our collaborators who are working in the field. Uh, Magdi Musa in Saudi Arabia, Mark Warmington in Australia, um, David Wu and Yuan Yuan Li, that ha they have been helping us in China. Um, then the, the group uh, of uh, Christian Young, Dylan Saranj, their PhD student who's working with uh, on flowering time with quinoa. And um, uh, Nathan Miller, um, who's, uh, who's been doing the, um, the um, seed algorithm. And uh, of course, also Washington State University for for also for giving me this opportunity to participate in the workshop and uh, for being great collaborators. It's, uh, it's been very fun to, to work on uh, everything together. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>